Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you, and welcome to our webinar on three tools to drive customer-centric innovation in financial services. Uh, this webinar will uh, cover and build upon some of the ideas that Matt and I wrote about in the recent article on the same name, and which uh, we will post in the chat window if any of you haven't had a chance to look at that or would like additional information that will go into more detail than we will cover uh, in this webinar. Now, I am sure that all of you would agree we are living through uh, a very interesting period of change, uh, particularly in financial services. Uh, in the last few weeks alone, we have seen the Fed raise interest rates uh, to the highest level in 16 years, uh, the collapse of both Silicon Valley Bank and uh, the acquisition of Credit Suisse by UBS, and of course, uh, the arrival of ChatGPT4 and its plugins all of which taken together is going to have enormous consequences for financial institutions. At times like these, leaders can certainly choose to double down on their core business, uh, but these forces also create windows of opportunity for forward-thinking leaders to ask fundamental questions about how their organizations are positioned to thrive in the future. In a site exists, to help you work through challenges like this. Our mission is to empower, uh, empower forward-thinking organizations to navigate disruptive change and own the future. And for 20 years, since our founding by Harvard Business School professor Clayton Christensen, we have worked alongside our clients, people like all of you, uh, to think through and help prepare and navigate these types of change. So we see um, a lot of familiar names in the chat, some former clients. Uh, good to see you all and some new names. So we are honored, privileged uh, to have you choose to spend the next hour with us. Uh, my name, uh, for those of you who I have not had the chance to meet, is Alistair Trotter, and I will be one of your hosts for the webinar today. I have been a part of the Innersight team since 2006, and I lead our financial services practice. I started my career with Capital One nearly 25 years ago and had the privilege of living through several disruptions in uh, that space, most notably uh, dot com crisis, the arrival of the internet as a new high risk alternate channel for credit card applications, and uh, the development of what Capital One originally called information based strategy, of which we would now think of as uh, big data and analytics, which fundamentally changed the way the world thought about. Uh, credit scoring and uh, how to think about running a credit business. Um, and my colleague, Matt McGrath, with whom I had the pleasure of co-authoring uh, the recent article, will be co-hosting the webinar with me today. So before we dive in, uh, let us briefly cover a few housekeeping notes. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and we will make the link available to everybody in the chat and via a follow-up email. And we will also share the slides to the presentation uh, in that communication. We have muted the lines for obvious reasons, just to allow uh, Matt and I to control the conversation. Um, if you have questions, please submit them using the Q&A function, which you'll see at the bottom of your Zoom bar here. Um, we will try to answer questions as we go, uh, keep it a conversation. So I've told Matt to interrupt me as we go, and I will interrupt him if a really good question uh, pops up. Uh, we will also reserve some time, uh, 10, 15 minutes or so at, toward the end of the conversation and address questions then. We will have one poll. You will see that pop up on your screen. We'll ask you that you select some answers and hit the submit button, most importantly, so that we can see the results uh, as that will uh, have a bearing on where we spend our time toward uh, the latter part of this discussion. Um, and of course, we have the chat window open. Uh, it was active when we first dived in. It's quiet right now, but feel free to comment. Um, we will try to capture questions there uh, if at all possible, but it's easier to use the Q&A function as we can monitor uh, the questions and decide which ones to answer. Uh, as we go through. So let's set the scene here for, for this webinar. Over the years, Matt and I have had the um, privilege of working together on a number of projects across various different financial services organizations. And the stories we thought we would share today stem from those experiences, serving different businesses um, focused on small business banking, consumer banking and wealth management will be the, the stories that we share today. Now, in our work with these organizations, we've, we realized that they all share a number of things in common. 
Um, and this is likely the case for, uh, for all of you joining us in the webinar today. First, all of these organizations are incredibly sophisticated in terms of the products they created and managed, um, as well as the underlying technologies and platforms that they have built to support them over the years. They were also very successful organizations, ranging from, in the three stories we'll tell today, five to $30 billion uh, in revenues. However, in all three organizations, growth over the past few years had slowed, and the leadership teams had been growing increasingly dissatisfied with their success rate when it came to launching new products or making inroads into non-traditional customer segments. One of these organizations engaged us in late 2020 uh, and asked for our help in strengthening their approach to product management. And after kicking off that project, the first thing we did, as we, as we often do, is to go and have conversations with a number of different people, leaders, practitioners inside that organization to try to get a sense for what they thought was working well and what they saw of as challenges. And during those conversations, we learned a lot about their current approach to product development and their journey to becoming you know, a more agile organization. But there was one comment from one particular leader that just really stood out. Um, and I think it sets up the, the scene for this discussion nicely. And that leader summarized their problem in this way. We've spent all this time becoming agile, was the, the, the particular case for this uh, leader. And now we know how to build things the right way. But the real question that our organization is struggling with is, well, what are the right things that we should build? Now, this company is not alone. And in fact, we see a variation uh, of this question in many of the organizations that we work with, particularly those that have reached a level of market success at scale and thus have this level of complexity involved that sometimes creates the barriers that we're going to talk about, the challenges that now have to be overcome to answer the question of what the right things are to build. But we just thought this was a really nice way of articulating the challenge, and it sets up perfectly what we'd like to explore um, in this webinar. So there are myriad challenges that companies face when trying to figure out what products and solutions to build, but there are three that rise to the top. And so we're going to focus on those three challenges for the discussion today. Challenge number one is the lack of clarity um, on which customer and customer need is being addressed. What we often find in the organizations we work with is that the focus is on the solution, um, the technology, the roadmap, and so on, with only the strategy group, perhaps the product owner, the marketing or insights teams taking the time to think deeply through who the, the customer is and what the underlying problem is that they're seeking to address. Even in those organizations where they can clearly articulate the customer need, we tend to see that the way in which the customer need is described reflects uh, a somewhat homogenous or generic type of customer. And perhaps even more importantly, the way in which the customer need is articulated often fails to make clear choices about which customers you are targeting and which customers you are not targeting. It's only by showing the contrast between here are the set of needs, these are the ones we want to focus on, you can actually bring clarity to where you want to focus. So in a moment, Matt will introduce a tool that we call a market map, which helps bring focus to these needs, the circumstances that give rise to the needs, and will allow you to bring clarity to what you propose to focus on, as well as where you don't wish to focus. The second challenge is that investment dollars are spread too thinly to make an impact. It, it's in the nature of leaders to try to satisfy all the competing budgetary requests from the various projects or project leaders in their organization. This bias to say yes, leads to large, overly large portfolios of projects being funded in most organizations. If you consider that most product or innovation portfolios, um, it's probably true that somewhere around 20% of the investments actually yield 80% of the results. As such, there is a big risk that you overinvest in a number of projects that probably shouldn't have received funding and starve the most critical projects of the funding they really needed to generate outsized returns. So Matt's going to share a tool that we call strategic focus areas, which we believe can help bring focus to the small number of areas where you should focus 
to drive growth and where you should put disproportionate levels of your investment. And then the third challenge that we'll talk about today is the challenge of um, a lack of differentiation, bringing undifferentiated solutions to market. So consider for a moment the generic nature of so many products, especially in financial services, basic checking, savings, auto loans, um, term life policies, 401k accounts, mortgages. If I was to lay out three competing offerings in any one of those product areas, most of us would be hard pressed to articulate the ways in which any one of those offerings was trying to differentiate from the others. The need for differentiation is fierce. In this era of freely flowing information, product aggregators, social networking, the best products and services quickly capture outsized share. So Matt's going to share one of my favorite tools to overcome this challenge, a tool that we call a performance map, which helps explore how competing solutions make trade-offs between different types of features, packages of features, in order to address a customer need. And this will shed light for you as the innovator on where you should focus your product development in order to create a more compelling and differentiated solution. So before I pass to Matt to introduce the, the tools that we've talked about, uh, I'd love to conduct a, a quick poll and get a sense from those of you in the audience today for of these three challenges, which of them do you see as being the most prevalent in your organization? Uh, feel free to vote for one, two or three, with the cautionary note that if everyone votes for all three, we'll have somewhat uninteresting data. So just curious, just trying to get a sense. So Matt, if you'd launch the poll here, um, then uh, you should everyone should see a couple of options. Uh, would love just to see a quick set of votes uh, and see, are all of these equally challenging? Do one or two of them stand out? We'll keep us open another 10 seconds or so. Just wanna get a, a quick stab uh, at what the results look like. Uh, and then we'll make sure we spend appropriate time uh, on the, the the ones that rise to the top. All right, looks like we've got a good number of votes in, Matt. Do you want to end the poll and share results and uh, uh, share any comments you have? Yeah, thank you, Alistair. So I think the clear, the clear leader is lack of clarity on which customer and need is being addressed. Um, and this is very common, I think, as Alistair was saying, with... Um, you know, design targets that can be too generic. Um, so that's actually the first tool we're going to talk about today. So that's great. Uh, what's that to you, Alistair? Uh, number, I, I'm I'm wildly unsurprised. Uh, my favorite challenge and my favorite tool is undifferentiated solutions. Um, I think that this is, it's it's you can spend a lot of time talking about customers and jobs, which we will do so, and setting strategy work. Uh, the the reality on the ground in many organizations is. Uh, the large majority of folks are actually focused on the solution development. So I like the practical nature of uh, this third challenge, which is, okay, we've been told what our customer and target is. Let's really talk about how we can double down on differentiation, making something more compelling. Um, and you know, between us, I think that you can compensate for a lack of clarity on customer needs to a degree by really, really thinking hard about why you're, how you're going to differentiate a product. It, it forces you to address some of those other questions. So yeah, uh, all these problems are real. Uh, looks like we're gonna have a good discussion. So with that, Matt, I'm gonna pass to you um, and let's dive into the first of our tools. Great, thanks, Alistair. So as Alistair mentioned, three tools today to, to address these challenges. The first, the market map, we're gonna visualize the opportunity space based on customer jobs to be done and circumstances. The second, strategic focus areas, codifying those opportunities by defining the customer serve the job to be done the kinds of solutions needed and the strategic rationale for that opportunity. The third, which Alistair has been uh, has been highlighting, is the performance map, which is a way of analyzing and visualizing how competing products perform and can help you identify unaddressed needs in the market. Um, and we'll talk at the end about how these three tools work together, uh, both across the three of them and also as part of a strategy and innovation process. Um, so we'll put it all together at the end. First tool, market maps. Um, and we're going to share a client example to bring this to life. So a couple of years ago, we were working with a regional bank um, focused on small business banking. Uh, they had a strong base of deposit customers among small businesses and really valued the stickiness and reliability of those deposits. Uh, the leadership team felt that there was likely an opportunity to better monetize that customer segment, attract new small businesses and retain existing small businesses by developing a broader suite of offerings to, uh, to sell to those clients beyond just their basic checking and lending offerings. 
The goal was to identify needs that small business customers could credibly buy from their bank. And we wanted to be really expansive in terms of the problems we might address. So we started looking at this by creating a market map to visualize the small business banking opportunity space. This is a simplified version of that market map. Um, and we started by looking at circumstances and circumstances are the relevant context of someone's life that influences how they seek to address their jobs to be done. You can see the circumstances at the top of the page along the horizontal axis. In this case, we identified two circumstances that really drove differences between the segments in terms of how well they could address their jobs to be done. First was the kind of business that they were operating. You can imagine that there's a really big difference between the needs and solutions available to say a medical practice, right, where the environment is office based, you have to work with, you know, insurers to check eligibility, you have to get the copay for the patients, you have to get reimbursement after the fact, versus a restaurant, who's really driven by their POS system. Um, and that needs, needs that to work very properly in order to manage the really thin margins in a business like that. So industry vertical, first circumstance you see at the top of the page. The second dimension is more of a psychographic kind of kind of view of the attitude that the business owner themselves has towards the growth in their business, right? So are we expecting kind of no or modest growth or do we have a higher fast growth aspiration? And that factor really influenced how business owners were satisfied by the various opportunities in the market. So you can see in this map that there's a pretty big sort of left to right difference inside each of those black columns in terms of the, the needs that pop up as being unsatisfied. Um, vertical access, their jobs to be done. A job to be done is the progress someone is seeking to make in their life. They're not only functional jobs to be done around pay my bills or give me time, time back to focus on my core business, but also emotional and social jobs around have confidence that I'm covered financially, be seen as an effective leader by my team. So I'll focus on a example here um, just to illustrate this, which is a combination of the third row of jobs to be done around make my financial operations simple and easy with the constructor and trade vocations vertical. Um, that business owner, you know, particularly in this kind of no or modest growth um, circumstance, you know, they often work, you know, hands on on a job site, right? And consequently, they're out there, you know, in their truck on their mobile phone, trying to track down materials, trying to manage new bids um, to win new business. And we found there aren't necessarily great solutions out there in the market for that business owner's on-the-go needs. Identified there might be an opportunity there, which is what that green shading in the box indicates. The power of market maps is they force you to get granular about those intersections and really kind of kind of learn the stories of your customers that occur at each at each intersection of this matrix. Um, as you think about creating them within your organization, remember that what they do is they help address the challenge of the lack of clarity on which customer in need is being addressed. The three keys to success here, first, focus on the circumstances that really matter. And by matter, we mean the change the products and services customers are looking for, right? And drive a, a change in perception of the solutions that are in the market. Second, look at non-consumption, considering where customers are not buying any solution at all or when they have to do things manually or with an Excel spreadsheet. Finally, you'll wanna cluster opportunities together as you start to see patterns emerge. These clusters can be codified into strategic focus areas um, as we'll talk about next. So our second tool is the strategic focus area um, and a first a definition. So what strategic focus areas do is they define four things. The what of innovation, right? Who is the customer we're gonna serve, or excuse me, what is the job to be done we're going to solve? Who is the customer we're going to serve? Uh, third is how, what kinds of solutions can help to address this job to be done. Um, and fourth is why, right? Why us? Why is this a good focus area for us? And we'll illustrate this with an example from uh, another banking client of ours. So this client had already done the market mapping um, and they had identified workers in the gig economy as a relatively unaddressed segment of customers. They came to us uh, hoping to identify some opportunities to address those customers. So as we looked at the circumstances, we, you know, we identified a subset of gig workers that are in relatively high levels of income, but whose incomes can be volatile month to month or year to year because they're freelance. Um, without that income volatility, they'd likely be very attractive customers for any bank, right? And you can think about occupations like um, fractional CFOs, freelance accountants, other kinds of professional services, where people are maybe working with other small businesses to uh, perform services for them and you know charge a high hourly rate but maybe don't work uh, in traditional environments um you know they don't they don't get a w-2 from an employer their cash flow can be volatile 
the banking system today in terms of the way we underwrite loans has trouble accommodating a situation like this. But we felt there might be an opportunity to build something to address those needs. You know, as you think about kind of other newer economy occupations, culture and entertainment figures, like artists, social media influencers could also fall into a bucket like this. So looking at the, the customer in that need, we kind of had the first two parts of our SFA already identified. So the what is help these customers with inconsistent or volatile income streams prove they're credit worthy. And the who is the gig economy workers with high but in, inconsistent incomes who are considering purchasing a new home. Right. What we added to this at this stage was the how, right? What, what can our client actually build to address this segment? So cash flow based or other alternative underwriting models, alternative credit worthy, credit worthiness indicators were things that we needed. And fortunately, our client actually had already started working on some of these things, um, which is how we ended up prioritizing this opportunity. Um, and the why, right? This is a big opportunity space. We estimated by the middle of this decade, it could be as, many, as much as $10 billion or more. Um, and it's an unaddressed segment, right? These folks kind of fall between the cracks in the market today. So it's kind of a market expansion opportunity that was attractive to the client. As you think about, excuse me, the power of SFAs as a tool is to force you to start customer first, right? Defining the kinds of solutions you need second, and then critically define the why, right? That's the focus in focus areas to select what you will do and importantly, what you won't do. So in terms of the keys to success, prioritize and specifically fund a small number of strategic focus areas for your business. You know, a global client of ours um, has only five strategic focus areas for their entire organization globally. And of course, those have expressions in different business units, different geographies, but they all ladder up to only five areas where they're really, really investing for growth. Second, a good focus area is customer first, right? Not solution first. I think particularly in financial services as an industry, we can be a little bit too product push, right? Sell this product to that customer. Instead, you should flip it, right? What does this customer need? What jobs to be done do they have? And then you can build products to fit them. And finally, SFAs can be a great way of communicating, do this, not that can help cascade strategy across your organization. All right, so that's strategic focus areas. The third one we'll talk about, I know there's some interest from the group on this one, is the performance map, um, which we use to identify opportunities for differentiation and avoid copycat products. The performance maps can be a little bit complex to use, so I'm gonna illustrate the challenge by telling you a story actually from my life. So I got married last year, uh, and as we were planning our wedding, my wife and I wanted to put together a budget to understand how much all this was going to cost. As anyone who's ever planned a wedding knows, this could be a complicated problem. The budget's interdependent with choices around the venue, food, how many people you're going to invite, etc. cetera. Uh, as we looked, we had two options to understand how much this was going to cost. Really, the first option is we could hire a wedding planner or some other professional to help us understand. And they could, they could help us identify the kinds of things you need to spend money on, um, prioritize spending across different categories to manage the budget. Um, they could do the heavy lifting. They could get the vendors and they could put the budget together uh, and save us all a lot of time. However, that, you know, that service is expensive, right? Four, even five figure sum on top of the other wedding expenses. And they do so much more than just budgeting, right? They, they do all the planning of your wedding. So in a lot of ways, they were overkill for this sort of narrow need we had around budgeting. The other choice we had is to do it ourselves in some way, right? We could look at tools available online through websites like The Knot or Zillow, talk to friends of ours who'd gotten married and had a spreadsheet we could use. Um, in doing this, we could get a good view of what we might spend money on, right? Decide what was important to us, particularly we could talk to friends whose weddings we'd been to, you know, ask them what they had done that we, that we enjoyed um, and learn a lot from that. Um, and that's free, you know, which is great. Um, but of course, when you're when you're using a wedding website, you know you're going to get a lot of marketing emails the minute you register, right? So maybe it's not actually so free, right? But the hardest part is that we would need to invest a lot of time in turning this information into a budget for ourselves. And we were looking for more help than that, right? So we had two choices, right? Both of which might get the job done. But how do we think about analyzing these trade-offs, right? From a business perspective, how do we think about helping customers find a better solution? So we do that with this tool we call the performance map. Um, and the key here is that we think of products and services as a bundle of trade-offs between features, right? And that's visualized on this map. Um, what we're measuring is the way those, those different bundles perform across different dimensions of quality from the customer's perspective, right? So this one is my perspective um, on the performance map for the job of creating a budget for my wedding. You can see that we're a little up and down across all the, uh, all the various dimensions. Um, and in particular, that the 
uh, wedding planner was sort of overshot. I offered one, many more features than we needed for this narrow goal of budgeting, but it cost too much, right? So not maybe a great fit for us. Now, if you're a wealth management firm seeking to, to be relevant to your clients, there could be an opportunity here to help clients navigate a major expense in their life, right? Particularly for younger people, this can be, you know, top two or three thing they spend money on in their, in their 20s and 30s, right? You can imagine creating a different bundle across these features, which makes different trade-offs and might appeal to customers in a different way. So we've illustrated that with this red line, right? Where we defined a potential new product that you could imagine building as a flow, right? Maybe with a financial planning tool, right? In particular, you can offer a more accurate budget picture then you can get in the DIY scenario, right? You can incorporate those um, recommendations and understanding about spending categories in a similar way as you could get in these other, other features, but you could offer more um, guidance in terms of how to create the budget to save people time. In exchange, you could ask for a, a small fee, right? To, you, know, you could charge a small fee for this service, right? This product you know, may, um, may appeal to a certain number of, of people and may be a great engagement tool. Um, the key point here is to explore different trade-offs between the features that might create a more compelling value proposition for your customers. In terms of trying to use this in your organization, remember the performance map helps address the challenge of building undifferentiated products that don't stand out from the crowd. Three things to keep in mind. First is this has to be from the customer's perspective, right? You should go out and you should speak to customers about why they're choosing one product over another and understand the implicit trade-offs that they're making right? Trade-offs are king, right? F figure out where customers will accept less of one feature to get more of another, right? And, and rebalance that value proposition to make it um, a better fit for what they need. The last, um, understand what workarounds or other coping mechanisms customers are using. Those helpful wa help wanted signs often point to a performance criteria not being satisfied or to the wrong set of trade-offs being embedded in a product. So I've talked about these three tools we recommend to drive customer-centric innovation. Alistair's going to talk a little bit about how they fit together and how they can fit into your strategy, innovation, and product development process. Thanks, Matt. So, you know, if I go back to the quote up front, uh, this is about not how do we build things the right way, but what are the right things to build? And so necessarily, these are all tools that tend to be used in the earlier stages of your innovation pathway or whatever your innovation process is. In fact, you know, arguably the, the market maps and the strategic focus areas might be so early in the innovation process that in your organization, that's a part of the strategic planning or the strategy process. So typically the order in which we presented them are, you know, represents the sequence in which you would typically find them inside any large organization. You're going to have an upfront high level strategic or innovation strategy question around uh, given how much growth or whatever revenue or, you know, profitability or cost savings we need to deliver from, you know, innovation, given what our core is unable to, to do. Um, what are the three to five, uh, what, what is the, the landscape of, you know, the problem space look like? And so you first use the market map tool to start to look at the, the ocean and say, here's where we want to go. You know, in some ways you might think of it as a, a, boil, the a boil the ocean type tool. The, the here is uh, that the purpose of the market map is to look at it comprehensively um, and say, of all the things, the problems that are out there, these are the ones that we think are would create the most economic value if someone were to solve them. As you now shift from the market map to the focus area, you're layering on additional questions. You're now saying not only is there value associated with solving that problem, but that we think there's value for us in solving it, given our capabilities and our ability to bring that to life. And this is, in fact, one of the you know three, four, five areas where we are going to invest disproportionate resources because we believe that this is where we will find growth over the next you know two, three, four years. And then once you've now handed off that opportunity area to a discovery team or uh, a product team that is starting to explore what the specific business model or the value proposition, the features, and start to think about what you know the the prototype, the MVP might look like. You can start to use performance maps as a tool to make decisions um, and ensure that you're not overly focused on the immediate and obvious product set. This is perhaps one of the, the builds I'd offer on what Matt shared with performance maps, which is the great thing about performance maps is they really help you expand your view on what the, uh, the real competitors are, where apathy is perhaps one of the, you know, one of the really big uh, competitors. 
And you could take the line and draw the apathetic line, which is, you know, zero cost, but it may have some consequences and, uh, uh, you know, to you. Uh, and so the real opportunity there with the performance maps is to, to think about what are you going to do more specifically, at least from a hypothesis perspective. Of course, there are still later stages in the innovation pathway where you now have to validate that your point of view about what it would take to be compelling makes sense. So, uh, you know, I'd reinforce that all of these tools are early stage tools to develop better hypotheses for where you believe growth will come and how to influence the, the early stages of that product development process. So with that, we just crossed uh, the, the halfway mark um, of the, the hour. That's all the prepared content that Matt and I had. We just wanted to briefly provide an overview of these three tools. As I mentioned earlier, there are a couple of places where you can find additional resources. Number one um, is the article that Matt and I wrote, which provides, I think, some hyperlinks as well. Uh, to our innovation performance hub, where uh, you can find on the Intersight website with additional tools. There's, there's templates available for, uh, for these tools there um, and additional case studies for how other organizations have used these, which we hope will be helpful. So at this point, what we'd love to do is open it up for questions. Happy to take questions on the three tools that we've shared, on the barriers, additional stories that we might have to tell. Um, that anyone has. So please use the Q&A function if you do have a question to submit. We already see a couple of these coming through. Um, and uh, Matt, I think we can probably start with the questions that we've already got popped into uh, the list. And I'm sure that more will come as we go. You want to yeah. take the first one, Matt? Sure. So the first question um, from Robert is strategic focus areas. Should companies now look at when to better understand when customer needs should be serviced? Um, I think it's a great question. You know, one thing we do think a lot about as we do this work with, with clients is particularly as it relates to opportunities created by new um, new trends or new technologies, right? Is that a is that a next five years, five years after, or more than 10 years away? Um, because there is a, a challenge with being too early um, as well as as well as with missing opportunities. So so the, the short answer is yes. Uh, when is also an important consideration as you think about creating strategic focus areas. Yeah, you know, my colleagues. Pontus Siren and Scott Anthony actually published a piece uh, recently. Uh, I'll have to ask our, our helpful elves behind the scenes to see if they can find the hyperlink to that piece in real time. But it introduces the idea of what is known as Kissinger's Cross, um, which essentially reflects that uh, as time goes on, you gain more information but have less freedom of action. Uh, putting that another way is there is a cost to being both early and late. If you're too early, the market hasn't figured out exactly uh, what the dominant design is uh, and the risk of you burning massive amounts of capital, say, you know, investing prematurely in the metaverse, uh, as one example that at least comes to my mind, um, is a risk. But on the other hand, if you wait too late, the unicorn has become a decacorn, multiples are high, chances of you catching up are low, and you may resign yourself to paying a premium for acquiring something um, which you know may or may not be uh, accretive to share value at that point. So uh, yes, timing is critical. I kind of like that build, which is, uh, and in fact, to be fair, I think in more complex versions of our SOA framework, <laughs> we have said there's, uh, the, the why is not only why us, um, uh, but also why now. Um, uh, and I forget if that was on our graphic earlier, but it, it's a critical critical question because the, you know there's plenty of... Uh, uh, fallen innovators who moved prematurely. That said, I would make the observation, which is, I don't think it's necessarily a problem as much to move too early, so long as you manage your investment. What really kills you and is the death of all startups is premature scaling uh, or running out of cash. <laughs> um, and so the trick is, if you're going to explore something, that's great. But what is your return on learning? Um, if you're learning a lot, but you're doing so for minimal investment, you can actually have, you know, weather vane type tests and experiments, have some hypotheses and monitor them over an extended period of time. And I think you can do that at relatively low budget. But yeah, the, the worst thing you can do is to go all in prematurely. Great. Um, so another question, Alistair, that, that I think is for you. Um, how do you select the competitor products you evaluate on the performance map? You were saying earlier that um, it can help understand yep. competitors you wouldn't have thought of. Uh, I'd say uh, be, de gui be guided by what the market does, right? So your customers will tell you what the competing products are if you ask the right questions, right? Um, you know, it's hard not to think of a, 
of Clay's milkshake story, <laughs> right? Uh, and, you know, for those of you who know it, this will make immediate sense. For those of you who don't know the story, I'm just going to say, go Google Clay Christensen milkshake story. But the takeaway from that story is that when um, you are thinking about how to innovate, you know, as a, a restaurant uh, who wants to innovate in the context of milkshakes, the competition is not the milkshake from down the street. It's the milkshake. Uh, sorry, it is the radio that someone listens to in a car to entertain them. It's the bagel and cream cheese they they made at home. Um, you know, these are the other things that they hired to get the job done. And they offered uh, some downsides as well as some upsides. But the bundle of trade-offs that the milkshake represented was all about trying to really address that consumer job and open up and expand the, the aperture for what the competitive set was. So how do you figure that out? Well, as Clay says in his story, they stood outside a fast food restaurant and interviewed people as they were leaving. And they asked a slightly quirky set of questions around, well, the last time you were in this situation of, you know, feeling hungry, you had a long commute. What other products did you consider hiring to get the job done? And by framing the question that way or something similar, you start to get a handle on um, what the real set of solutions were. Just as Matt shared his story of a spreadsheet versus a wedding planner, you don't typically think of these as competitors, but they are substitutes for each other. They offer different packages of uh, trade-offs and a, you know, a good product manager leader will ensure that the, the team considering feature sets has thoughtfully considered that full range of potential competitors. And the best place to go for that is the source, which is the, the, the consumer. So doing in-depth consumer interviews um, is probably a more powerful tool than doing surveys. In surveys, consumers tend to give you what they think you need. But in conversations with customers, you're far more likely to elicit the, the real uh, competitive offerings uh, if you have the right type of conversational interview. Right. Matt, I got it. There's another question in the chat here. Maybe I throw this yeah. one uh, to you. Um, so this one's from Sankara. Uh, can you please provide an example of a highly commoditized, undifferentiated service that used the framework and differentiated its offerings, thereby launching solutions and products? So essentially, where have we seen performance maps in action? Yeah, yeah, it's a great it's a great question, um, and I think the, the example that leaps immediately to mind is uh, what Rocket Mortgage has been able to do um, in the mortgage space. So, you know, particularly since the financial crisis, mortgages are mortgages, right? They're they're backed um, by government guarantees, and therefore they're pretty standardized. So, at a given level of um, uh, credit score, you know, you're going to get all the same offerings from all the same banks. And so, Rocket, you know, what they've done is they've innovated around the process of getting you approved for your mortgage and cut you know, multiple days out of a 30 day process to get it done in 20 days, right? And there's a couple of insights I think that lie behind that. One is just understanding um, that folks like things to move faster, I think is always a good, a good place to think about innovation. But second, it helps you be more competitive if you're making the offer the, for the house, right? You can close in less time than somebody working with a legacy bank, right? And that's a different performance criteria than, um, than you might traditionally have thought of. And it really is unlocked be because of this insight around, you know, all mortgages are effectively the same. So we have to compete on the experience and on the customer, um, the customer value proposition in terms of how they access the service, not in terms of the cost of the service. That's one example. I don't know, Alistair, if there's another that springs to mind. Yeah, I mean, uh, so this one, you know, unnamed client can't talk about that one, but, um, you know, we did a project a short while back, you know, wealth management focused on sort of Gen X and millennials. And it was all about uh, how does one think about selecting a private banker. Um, and so, you know, the tool very quickly uh, highlighted, uh, you know, what, you know, I, I don't want to, I, I guess I want to take a pause here. The tool is a great way for capturing what might appear like common sense to many leaders and great product thinkers, right? So uh, it's not, I don't want to say that without this tool, you're not going to be successful. A lot of people, successful product managers do think this way. They instinctively think about you know, the trade-offs and the packages. What we offer up here is a way to uh, bring that, make that tool more accessible, make that thinking more accessible, and just highlight the importance of the underlying question that the tool is asking, you know, in the context of, um, you know, wealth management for certain generational groups. There has been a shift about the expectations of what a great private wealth management or private banking experience looked like in terms of right down to the physical aspects of the building or the room in which you receive, the expectation of what white glove service would look like, the expectation of getting a hold of your banker at any time of day for a conversation about your finances and how you get access to different types of investments, you know, how all of that changes. It moves to the digital world. It moves to dashboards. It moves to online. It moves to being able to invest um, in themes associated with whatever you care about. 
Um, and these were all subtle shifts, but uh, a lot of the more traditional wealth management, private wealth management firms based in Europe had um, really undifferentiated offerings. And a lot of it came down to relationships, but this firm wanted to move away from, it doesn't have to be about the network or the Rolodex of the wealth managers. What we want to do is offer a fully differentiated set of experiences and then build a technology backbone to support that. And the question was, okay, what set of experiences are we going to double down on? Um, where is it worth outcompeting um, versus just being good enough relative to the competition? And it just provided a structured way of working through that analysis um, and then launching a, a novel and now highly successful wealth management service in Europe. So uh, we're getting flagged here that we are almost at time. Our goal was to finish at three minutes uh, in three minutes time. So Matt, any other questions popping in? I think there's a few more. We probably have time for one. Yeah, I think probably time for just one more question. So I think um, on strategic focus areas, right? How do you think about prioritizing down to just those three to five that we were recommending? Okay, so how to how to pick the three to five? Um, okay, so I guess a couple of comments on that one. Um, firstly, often what we like to do tactically is come up with a longer list of potential focus areas, right? So on the market map that we often create, you know, sometimes that market map takes other forms. Um, but the goal is to come up with the laundry list of all the places where we think value will accrue to someone. So you notice I'm only talking about the customer and job. I'm not talking about whether it's us or whether we should do it. We then tend to do a first pass at prioritizing, which takes it down to, okay, from all the opportunity areas or focus areas, here's the set that we think are strategic. And we'll probably go for, you know, eight, nine, 10, recognizing that's too many. Now, what you want to start to do is you want to weave in uh, the economic value, the profit pool, the feasibility and timeline as potential uh, criteria against which you can evaluate. And simplistically, what we'll often do is we'll score each of the focus areas that we think are high priority. Really importantly, we want to make sure that this would be expected value associated with each focus area. So the probability you realize the value and the value available sums up to whatever the growth or financial targets that the organization wants from innovation. One of the great risks of an SFA focused approach is that all of these things you develop are nice to have. And when you find that what you tend to have happen behind the scenes is that resources flow towards the plan that came out of strategy and resources are only available for the plan. The innovation group is asked to go figure out, are there some interesting things we might want to go pursue for growth. We tend to find that if these, these conversations of what are the SFAs, if that's disconnected from a discussion about how much growth do we require from innovation and therefore we expect to invest in innovation, you can end up with a lot of experiments, science experiments, little accountability and uh, num uh, things getting yanked uh, from the innovation budget. What we try to do is strongly encourage a coupling of that resource allocation discussion. And essentially what you're trying to do is get leadership to commit because they want and need that innovation to be successful in order to hit their uh, financial targets. Um, and what that does is then creates a certain discipline and rigor around how resources are allocated. And in turn, how that portfolio of innovation is then managed over time and rebalanced to ensure that the resources are delivering you know, good ROI uh, and that the, the projects that are struggling to succeed are shut down and those which are really the big opportunities get doubled down on. So, uh, bunch of thoughts in there probably more than the two i thought i had so with that uh, matt i believe we are at time so um yeah. thank you everyone for joining uh, i really appreciate your time give you 50 minutes back to prepare for your next meetings uh as always we we noted that these are uncertain times inside exists to help forward thinking leaders navigate disruptive change we would be delighted to chat with any and all of you so please feel free to reach out via email uh, matt and i enjoy conversations with you all simply about what's going on how you're thinking about change. It keeps us fresh, keeps us updated uh, on what's going on in the market and helps us be more useful to all of you when we talk to you next. With that, thank you. Goodbye. We will talk again soon. Bye-bye.